lads, did you hear that uh, in the EU, 19% of all of the greenhouse gas emissions come from road transport? Isn't that crazy? Yeah, God, we need to do something about that. special episode of Nation Pride, a University of Liberty student special. On tonight's episode, we'll be looking at the effects the transport industry has on Ireland's climate, and what a group of US students are doing to tackle these effects. In tonight's episode, we'll be hearing from a fourth year mechanical engineering student, Cahill Roach, about what his group has been getting up to the past few weeks. In 2018, the transport industry held the largest share of energy used per sector in Ireland, a whopping 42%. In a similar way, in 2019, the transport industry accounted for the second largest share of greenhouse gas emissions, 20% in Ireland. Clearly, when looking to reduce the effect our country has on global climate change figures, the transport industry is the elephant in the room. The average petrol powered vehicle uses more than 50% of its energy through the exhaust as waste thermal energy. Our group developed a compact thermal heat recovery system for the average car. From concept development to weighted down selections, our group established that the final working model should be that of a 90 degree radial inflow turbine. Further design developments led to a final working model easily integrated into the average family car. The steam turbine is a much understated piece of modern engineering. Originally invented in 1884, it has been applied to many different applications over the last century. The turbine shown here has been specifically designed to improve automobile efficiency. As the rotor is capable of reaching speeds of up to 120,000 RPM, precise assembly is critical to ensure balanced operation under these incredible conditions. Assembly begins with the rotor body a conical shaped piece of stainless steel containing slots to locate the rotor blades into place. Once positioned correctly, the blades are individually welded to the body. In preparation for its mounting to the shaft, three dowel pins are pressed into the rotor body to ensure secure connection between the parts. The rotor body can then be fixed to the shaft. A specially designed fastener is installed in order to keep the body in position during operation. The next step is the assembly of the shaft housing. Two ball bearings are pressed into the machined aluminium component in order to allow the rotor to spin freely. The rotor assembly is then pressed into the bearings until it reaches its correct position. A sealing ring is positioned in a groove in the rotor shaft and an end cap is bolted in position to provide maximum sealing under extreme rotational speed. Assembly of the main housing of the turbine can now begin. The shaft housing is bolted in place to the base of the main housing. O-rings are placed and compressed between adjoining parts to prevent leakages into or out of the turbine. The nozzle ring is then mounted within the housing. Located by two dowel pins and the shape of the housing, the nozzle ring is prevented from moving in any direction. The lid of the main housing is then secured into position by six bolts around its perimeter. The final component is the outflow housing. Its internal bore precisely matches the rotor shape, a critical feature in ensuring all the steam passes through the rotor. When bolted to the main housing, assembly of the turbine is complete. There you have it. That's what's required to make a steam turbine. We hope we haven't left you in a spin. Good evening and welcome to the 6 o'clock news. Tonight we'll be discussing the design and analysis of Group B's radial turbine. To begin, we'll be speaking to Matthew O'Neill about the nozzle and blade calculations carried out last semester. Take it away, Matthew. Thanks, Ruth. In semester one, calculations were focused on optimizing nozzle and blade design for a steam turbine as determined in the brief. However, for safety reasons, testing was to be completed with air. 
So a second round of values were calculated to allow comparison between the theory and measurement. Step one with the calculations was research. After a lot of searching around, we based most of our work on these published sources. For our turbine, flow is accelerated through four separate nozzles, goes up the blade channel spinning the rotor, and exits axially. The main focus of the calculations was nozzle geometry and blade tip angles at entry and exit to the rotor. Converging diverging nozzles were designed to operate between pressures of 4 bar and 0.12 bar in order to accelerate the steam flow to 1,185 meters a second. Airflow through the system would produce 628 meters a second at 0.08 bar. In the blade channel, the flow enters radially and exits axially. Because mass flow and pressure are constant in the blade channel, velocity components could be calculated at the different radii for steam and air. Velocity triangles were calculated for the steam flow at inlet and outlet to the rotor. When resolved, they gave the optimum angles for nozzle position, inlet blade tip angle, and outlet blade tip angle. For air, the velocities were smaller, but the angles remained the same. The tangential change in absolute velocity from inlet to outlet was used to calculate the system torque, which resulted in power outputs of 3.58 kilowatts for steam and 1.86 kilowatts for air. And that's your calculations report. Back to you, Ruth. Thanks, Matthew. Up next is our CFD correspondent, Owen Stapleton, here to speak to us about his results. Jeez, Ruth, nearly forgot I was doing this. Get ready for that big commute all the way to the office. Firstly, we are going to look at the straight nozzle. This is the mesh that was generated for that nozzle. In this nozzle, it was a pressure-driven flow. The pressure dropped from four bar at the inlet to approximately 3,800 pascals at the outlet. In the vector seam, we can see the effects of this pressure-driven flow. The maximum velocity achieved was 658 meters per second. This is 4.8% higher than the calculated velocity. We are happy with the low percentage error. In the scalar seam here, we can see that the temperature drops from 292 Kelvin at the inlet to 76 Kelvin at the outlet. The temperature gradient here is 10.8% higher than the calculated temperature gradient. Again, we are happy with the low percentage error. All residuals in this model drop below 10 to the minus 8. This model is fully solved and fully converged. In this model, there is a mass flow rate of 1.6 grams of air per second. This value is 20% lower than the calculated value. Moving on to the static blade nozzle, we can see that this is the mesh that was generated for that model. Here is planar section 1 and planar section 2. In vector seam 1, we can see that there was a velocity inlet applied with a velocity of 317 meters per second at the inlet. And in vector scene 2, we go to the outlet here of the blade. We can see that a velocity of approximately 318 meters per second was achieved. This matches the calculations, which predicts that the inlet velocity matches the exit velocity. In the moment plot here, we can see that a final torque of 0.347 newton meters of torque was generated. Uh, this is for one blade in the model. Considering that in the turbine we have four nozzles, uh, this means that there is 0.1388 newton meters of torque generated in the model, which is 92% of the predicted value. And given that the relative velocities assigned here were for rotational speed of 12,680 rads per second, our model here generates 1.76 kilowatts of power. That's all from us here, Ruth. Back to the studio. Thanks, Owen. Last but not least, Keelan Fitzgerald will be giving us the rundown on the finite element analysis. Thanks, Ruth. In tonight's section of FEA, we'll be looking at Group B's thermal analysis of the turbine as a whole. This is an important stage of the FEA analysis, as any unexpected temperature drops, long components, can cause the material properties to change, which may affect bearing fits, and fastener fits. Now, let's look at some animations of the turbine under, under the heat applied. Shown here are the results for the heat at transfer analysis for the housing, base, shaft housing, rotary assembly, and nozzle. Air was applied to the outside ring of the nozzle at room temperature, which was taken to be 293 degrees Kelvin and an inner temperature of 97 degrees Kelvin. These were our theoretical calculations of what we expect the air drop to be. Then we ran an analysis and to see the heat drop across the nozzle. It worked as expected with no major changes. Shown here is a half cut of the turbine heat analysis. This was run to see how the shaft conducted heat. If it contracts due to the drop in temperature from room temperature, 
This can cause problems for the press fit bearings. We can see the bearing at the end of the shaft holds up to room temperature and will not be a concern in operation. By looking at the bearing closer to the rotor, we can see that it does collect heat from the shaft. This requires further investigation to make sure that both the diameters of the inner and the shaft diameter are remain at the room temperature diameters or shrink together to ensure a proper fit. This was done in two ways. Firstly, we looked at the undeformed shape. This is when the turbine is at room temperature. Secondly, we looked at the undeformed shape shown here, which confirms they do not shrink. It was also confirmed by measuring the inner diameters before and after the heat was applied. They both remained at 17 millimeters in diameter. I've been Keelan Fisher, your FA correspondent. Now, back to Ruth in the studio. Thanks, Keelan. That's it from all of us here at the 6 o'clock news. Remember to wash your hands and wear a mask. Goodbye. I know what we can do. Between the sudden bulls and the bells